All right, let's show Judge Lennon again if you still have that there because now we're going to talk about this. So callers, if you want to call in, we're going to talk about the judiciary. Uh, she's in the judge in the first judicial district, uh, working primarily out of Scott County. And um, so we can come back here. And I have on my guest here, uh, John Miser. Thank you for coming on again. You bet. Uh, <laughs> we sure had a lot of comments and uh, a lot of uh, interest in the last show you were on with the uh, oath of office not being filed by a judge. And kind of uh, that's creating quite an uproar in the community because uh, I went down to the legislature and I talked to a couple legislators and they knew about it mm. <laughs> okay <laughs> right so uh, and I asked them well what are you gonna do about it <laughs> <laughs> you need to do something because mm -hmm. it's not happening because that person should not step into that office the next day and so they go well you know yeah we better check into it he says well this is you know part of your responsibility to to deal with this but I tell you what happens also is that the uh, one representative that I talked to who was looking into some judicial issues in Carver County um, is now being set up and mm -hmm. trying to be lawsuits or, or code violations and various things. Really crazy issues are coming up and they're mm -hmm. trying to go after them. Things that you would talk about first and say, hey, you know, you should think about this, do this, mm -hmm. you know, if it is an issue, but they're not doing that. Mm -hmm. They're coming after them hard right away. So we'll give you uh, more information on that as it comes, uh, it comes to light. But anyway, so I want to talk first about, let's recap the oath of office issue before we get into your multitude of other <laughs> issues sure, here. Sure, sure. But uh, you found out that Judge Lennon didn't file an oath of office. Didn't file and didn't take. And didn't take. Didn't take. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Wh which is bizarre in right. any case. So how did you find that out? Uh, I made a document request of the uh, Secretary of State. And that's okay. how you do it, because the judges are to file their oath of office. Well, let's show uh, graphic number 24, unless you change the numbers there. <laughs> with the Secretary of State. Okay. And so the judge will, they'll, they'll file that. And um, <clears throat> um, so I made a request of the Secretary of State, and it came back and I got a document from them that said, oath not found. Okay. So no oath on file. Okay, well there's the document you filed. That's the document that I made Okay, the and let's go of. down to the next one, number 25. So that just makes a request. Can you please give me a copy of uh, Carolyn Lennon's oath? And then and over here it, it says, comes there. Yeah. And you can see in there it says, uh, <clears throat> oath for Carolyn Lennon not found. It's in the middle of the, of right. the uh, paragraph there, or the middle of the uh, body of the letter. Yeah. And just those few short words and says, oath not found. Okay. So the only evidence I have is that she hasn't filed. And uh, I, you know, according to Minnesota legislature, you are required to file an oath. Right. So <clears throat> they've mandated that the, that the judicial officer has a duty to perform. So she's failed the file component. And uh, it then took a few w little while later then to find out, oh, let's go make another request. So I made another request of the Secretary of State weeks later to say, has she filed an oath? Because I noticed her in a recusal hearing say, hey, I would like you off my case. Right. You aren't qualified and you've ex exhibited 50 items of bias. Uh -huh. So she gets to hear that, and she decided right. she wasn't biased and that she was good to go, right. that she didn't need to take or file an oath. She didn't need to, she said? Well, by her actions. Yeah. By okay. her actions. Her actions would say, no, I'm good to go. I'm not going to recuse myself. I'm going to sure. sit on your case. Right. Um, so then I made another request to the Secretary of State, and then they gave me back a document that she had filed her oath, but you know, a number of years later, yeah. a number of weeks later. Uh, let's show that, number uh, 26. Okay. Just... Yeah. So, right. so there it is. There's her oath of office, and you can see the date filed that says January 23rd, 2013, in the upper right-hand corner of the circle there. And it shows that, you know, she signed the oath on the 18th of January, 2013. And, you know, she was required to do that years ago, uh, when she, she was, was elected, appointed in uh, 2008 by Palenti, and then she ran for election in 2010, yeah. and so right away that first um, Monday of, that of, the, of, of the new thing, she's right. So, so she now had she's not going on four years. Well, well, what's the statute? 
That says uh, statute number two. Well, the statute is, um, there's a thing called, you know, to determine vacancies in office. Right. And the Minnesota legislature has provided very specific language interpreting the Constitution, and it's deemed 351.02, and it's termed vacancies. Right. And it says the, off the, the office is vacant upon the following conditions. And sub-6 says the judicial, you know, officers failure or neglect to take an oath they vacate the office which is such important language failure or neglect right because a judge can fail to do that purposefully and then say I'm not going to be held accountable I didn't sign an oath I didn't swear any oath well mm -hmm. you can't hold me accountable right so we, on failure or neglect oh I forgot mm -hmm. what difference does it matter because if you did it based on failure and you you can just go and say well I forgot Right. <laughs> you know, right. so it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter right. the motive at all. Right. And, and so when the office is vacant, there's only, you know, and I've notified the governor. I've uh -huh. written him letters. I haven't gotten a response back. But I notify him, hey, there's a vacancy in the first judicial district. Here's the evidence. Right. Because the governor has the power in the Constitution to appoint when there's a vacancy. Right. So, you know, Lenin, like we just saw running there right. to go swear the oath, Right? She can't go run there and swear the oath and no, go grab a vacant right. office. I mean, you not. could do it, I could do it, but we could all go run and, you know, right. file an oath with the Secretary yeah. of State. So that office is vacant, and there's only two conditions upon which, you know, an office can be refilled. It's either by appointment by the governor or election. Right. So she would have had to run for election or be appointed again. Yeah. To, to go through there. But so this is all going to be decided by our Supreme Court. We're going to see what they're going to do, uh, how they're going to make this decision, because I've got a petition before the Supreme Court, you know, saying, you know, what rules? Yeah. The Constitution or judicial doctrine? Right. And, well, a, a judicial doctrine should say they're out. <laughs> Well, judicial you know. doctrine is they're sort of providing cover for themselves. They're misinterpreting rules and trying to provide what it looks like cover because it, it's gone all the way up through, it's from my opinion. It just yeah. looks like, you know, the uh, uh, chief judge of the First Judicial Court, Ed Lynch, said, no, nope, she's good to go. Yeah. Uh, the appellate court said, no, nope, she's good to go. Wow. So now we've got the Lynch. Supreme Court to, to go through and file this. But So that's where it stands and as and every Wednesday the Supreme Court will issue their rulings of what they're right. doing so we're still waiting on Irby to find out what they do in that case because mm -hmm. there's some similarities but there's also some very significant differences right Irby is whether she resided the judge had an oath right and she resided well, or didn't reside in the district in this case we got a judge who failed mm -hmm. to take and file her oath and now remember Walton v Arizona Supreme Court case it says trial judges are presumed to know the law. Yes. Presumed to know the law. Yes. Well, and this is what I was telling the legislature, some members of the legislature, you have to file a bill of impeachment on this. This is impeachable. Right. Uh, she's committing crime after crime by uh, usurp usurping this <coughs> position. Yeah. And uh, you got to impeach her and get her out of there. And, well, they're, and they're afraid. But what they've told me, they said, well, no, no, John, you need to go to the, the Board of Judicial Standards. So fine, okay, yeah. I did that. Yeah. Just this week, I didn't bring the document, but November 8th, Judicial Board of Standards said, that's not in our purview. Yeah. We, well, that, we don't deal with the oath of office thing, or we'll wait to that, see what happens. They but do. So they don't. They do. That's but a discipline. they didn't. Yeah, but they didn't. But when a legislature says, go to, that's a scam. No, you, that's your responsibility. You have the authority. That's what the Minnesota Constitution Constitution says you have that authority to discipline a judge. Uh, right. So well, it's kind of frustrating. It's a game it's, that goes. It's, it's, it's very frustrating because I'm not getting any uh, you know remedies. We're supposed to be able to get a remedy, and so far it seems like I'm getting blocked off. Sure. Well, it's just, this is huge. This right. is really really huge. I also I also filed a complaint because it, there's there's crimes that are committed with this allegedly. Right. I don't know, but I filed you know a criminal action last May to ask the Scott County Sheriff's Department to look into it. Uh -huh. They looked into it. They filed a, you know they filed and sent a report up to the Scott County Prosecutor Patrick. Silberto, uh -huh. and uh, they're not doing anything. Okay, they're not doing anything. They're not going to prosecute. Well, that yeah, would be interesting to see that report. But we got other things to go mm -hmm. on here. So it, it isn't just that Judge Lennon doesn't have her oath of office. She's doing other things that, right, on the face of it, are illegal and improper. Well, it's just been tough. It's just <laughs> been really tough. So um, the beginning of a case 
is, you know, your very beginning, I'm in, I'm in a family dissolution case, mm -hmm. so a, a divorce proceeding, and the very first meeting, your first exposure with the court, this is really my first exposure with the court, is what they call an ICMC conference, and that was on... And the ICMC stands for... Initial Case Management Conference. Okay. And this is supposedly a great way to help settle cases, to help make them go a little fast. Find and out what you agree about first, get that right. done, and then the... The questions that have difficulties, yeah. then, then you take them to the judge. Nothing adversarial. Right. No motions. Not allowed to bring a motion to this. Nothing adversarial. Judge but doesn't even make any orders. She'll only make orders upon agreement. Right. Only upon agreement. Right. So only okay. if the parties agree. So, uh, you know, that's... Um, that was document number one. It just shows that, but I just wanted to, you know, let our you know studio audience know that, you know, that's what it says. Do, do we have so graphic of it? Here we go. Graphic number one, and okay, it's actually down a little bit, so we're not going to really see it. So right down there, where I've got it starred, and it says down at the very bottom, it says uh, agreements may be included in an order, but the court will not hear or decide any contested matters. Okay, so really clear. Um, my son is living in a paid-for home that I paid for. I, I have started a college fund for him. I pay for his health care. Uh, I pay for his food. I pay for a significant portion of his food. I help contribute to his complete well-being. So I'm not a deadbeat dad. Right. Okay? So He's taken care of. He's taken care of. He's got shelter. He's got all the basic necessities of life. So at the ICMC hearing, I did not agree to a child support order. Okay. Okay. So then that has to go to the... Court. So that would, what would happen then is if the opposing side wanted to try and do it, they'd have to submit a motion right. after the ICMC hearing ruling an order. Yeah. So that's what would happen. So we had the ICMC hearing in June 26, 2012. Mm -hmm. That was the date of the hearing. The order came out July 19th. So we got a gap of time there. Mm -hmm. Well, what I didn't realize is all of a sudden how I could be exploited potentially by you know a savvy attorney on the other side. Is it really savvy? Well, you know, it's it's in a way. So uh, document number two, this this attorney named Brian Sobel sent a, a letter into the court. So this isn't a motion. And in there, so Brian Sobel sends a letter on July 12th. And he kind of makes it sound like, oh my God, you know, you know, pursuant to the judge request, I've attached the party's 2010's tax return. You know, and then further on that I've highlighted in yellow, it's uh, the next bit. It says, oh, and Miss Miser says that they had monthly expenses of $8,000 a month. You know, we maybe spent $2,000 a month, but they're inflating figures here. Uh -huh. And then right. at the very bottom, the last Standard arrow there, procedure. you know, Mr. <laughs> Sobel says, I apologize for the delay in providing this information. As advised the court, I was out of town until July 3rd. I'm so sorry. He supplies them a child guideline support worksheet where he alleges that... We made ten, almost ten thousand dollars a month on a joint tax return, and they have, uh, you know, husband and wife on that money, and he attributes it all to me, mm -hmm. which was erroneous. Yeah, and so therefore he comes up with a, a calculated support payment of one thousand twenty-eight dollars a month. Okay. And if we go to you know number three, I can just you know I, I can show the folks here. But, on, but this is without a hearing. There's no hearing. This is now happening after the ICMC hearing. No agreement for a child support order. No, no discussion between the attorneys. The attorneys did not make a presentation to the judge. No, no. Just this one ex parte. Yeah, just well, this, and then my response back to it. When I saw number yeah. three, if we can go back to it real quick here, but on number three here, I wrote a letter back to the court after I saw a letter after I saw you know Brian Sobel's email letter, and I said, "Look, I object to Mr. Sobel's characterization that I agreed to temporary child support. I did not agree to a temporary support order for child support. I already pay more than ninety percent of my of my son's total expenses. I don't need a court mandate to care mm -hmm. for my son." So, that's essentially what occurred there. And, uh, you know, if we, uh, all that didn't really matter because if we go to item number four, the judge issues an order. And it says on there under number seven where I have the second arrow. So the first arrow is just saying this is the ICMC order, uh, you know, for the beginning of our process. And it says petitioner, and that would be me, right. shall pay basic child support in the amount of 1028 per month, commencing July 1st, 2012. So this okay. is... You know, in an ICMC hearing when they said, no contested matters, only by agreement. Well, you just saw my letter in the previous one. I object. Right. Does that sound like an agreement That's to you? That's not an agreement. 
right? right? And erroneous information. So this is sort of the beginning of my experience. And this was one of the items that I put in there as bias for my recusal motion. But mm -hmm. the judge, you know, said, well, that's not bias. Sure. That's not bias. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. So, uh, you, you know, we see this happen. Right. Uh, fairly often. Um, this is different though. I mean, this is a, a unique twist in that you usually get to defend yourself against the numbers. But, so then what What happened beyond that then? Well, okay, so then what happened is, is kind of, uh, you know, well, you contested it. You were contesting. Well, I contested it all the way along the right. way and I was, you know, uh, stonewalled. Right. Stonewall, the judge just did not. She said, well, you know, provide a new tax return. I provided new tax returns. Provide new information to show your incomes. And she just, ignored it okay so it was ignored but anyway so now I've got this number of a thousand twenty eight a month mm -hmm. and I'm going like oh this is where it's gonna lead up to the other things where I believe it leads into both money laundering right and perpetrating a fraud upon the court okay okay so um, in April of 20 uh, of, of uh, 2013 uh, the judge issued an order that said uh, it's number five, and she said um, um, we had a we had a hearing, a contempt hearing, uh -huh. and in that contempt hearing, which was based on the fact that I took my son to the the boys' state high school hockey right, tournament, right, right, yeah. remember we talked about that, right, that was so, the last show, yeah, talked to took him to the boys' state high school hockey tournament, and for this they said we're fining you because you took him out of school, uh huh, kindergarten. Well, you're the parent. I'm the parent. Forty-year family tradition. I took him out of. You know there. how much how damaging that is to a child at four years old if you take him out for one day. Right, right. He was five it wrecks at the time. Their life. Yeah. Right. So, anyways, being <laughs> facetious. Right. Uh, it's, it's just uh, crazy. So they find. Well, me. the school loses money. Right. So number five here, they find me sixty-three hundred dollars, and if we get. Uh, uh, scroll down to see uh, second number five that we had. That was the first number five we took a picture of. So it's the second number five. There we go. And uh, in this here, under the uh, arrow there, it says petitioner shall deposit sixty three hundred into the respondent attorney's trust account. I've I've never seen that. Right. I I mean maybe it happens, but I I've never seen that before. Right. It's just crazy. And then so, the second arrow okay. points out respondent's attorney is authorized to use $1,300 of those deposited funds to pay for the services of Janine Massaro's a parenting time expediter. But uh, wasn't that money, the 6300 for child support? Right. So if you look at the very bottom of We're, this here, if you go to the bottom of the order here, we can see that the date, a little further down, down further, let's scroll a little more if we can. Okay, well, it's not going to go down all the way there, but this order was dated April 8th, 2013. Okay. Two orders came out that day. This was the first order, so you're correct. It says petitioner shall deposit 6300 So now let's go to the uh, number six, if we may. And in number six, we see that you know here it is april 8th this is the second order that came out that day and if we scroll down to where the arrows are we can see petitioner shall deposit 6300 representing child support arrearages with respondents counsel by april 13th deposit was also ordered in, in the court's contempt order of april 4th but what, which also was amended on the 8th and does not create an additional obligation of this first deposit. So they've changed the name from $6,300 because there was no statutory support for that. Uh -huh. I don't even know if there's statutory support to take child support and put it into the opposing attorney's no. IOLTA account, but it's no. putting it out of view, and now they're starting to hire quasi-neutrals, Right. which right now Janine Maceros has denied me all my parenting time. So that's, that's sort of what that person has done yeah. to me. And I've, I've dealt with her. Yeah. She... Uh, terrible. Yeah. She's a terrible person in my book. Yeah. Uh, so then, eight days later, I just kind of want to buzz through so the audience can see that we're dealing with facts here. So item number seven, item number seven, this came out a week later, and if we scroll down to number five where I've got the arrow, we can see on this order here, this was another order in judgment, it said respondent's motion for custody evaluation is granted. Uh, Respondent's counsel is authorized to use funds deposited to pay one half the retainer fee for Karen Irvine to begin the custody evaluation. Karen Irvine's initial retainer fee is over $6,000 for a custody study, and huh. a custody study that goes anywhere between fifteen dollars and $25,000. Now, right. 
I had asked the judge to use guardian ad litems or other custody people that were either $1,500 or $4,000 for a complete study. The other side, my opposing side, says we don't have enough money, we don't have enough money, but they brought this motion for Karen Irvine for all this money, and it doesn't and, make and sense to me. you were paying me. the full freight? Did the well, judge order her the, to pay the, any? Yeah, the judge ordered her to pay half it, but the judge was ordering me to pay it, you know, half this freight, and I didn't want to. Yeah. Right? I, I, I didn't That's want to. That's a contested to. issue. A contested issue. So if we go to number hmm. eight, so let me get this up here for the folks. We can see that this order came out June 3rd, and... Uh, the, it says the uh, uh, you know petitioner shall make a payment to the attorney's trust account in the amount of sixty three hundred by four o'clock, four thirty on May twenty third, or turn himself in to begin serving a jail sentence. And uh, uh, I wonder if it scrolls down a little further. Okay, maybe I missed that uh, on there with the screen. Who are you looking for? Yeah, I might have missed this. I had another part there, and it says one half of her fees. It says, uh, the court finds Miss Irvine to be reasonable and her expertise necessary under these current circumstances. Respondent's counsel is directed to use $3,125 of the deposited child support funds to pay for the petitioner's portion of the retainer. Now, just so the, uh, the audience knows, retainer. Karen, Karen yeah. Irvine, was uh, uh, she lost her license, or she gave it up in 2009 to the Board of Psychology. So hmm. for the court to call her thing for her expertise, and it said, we're not going to base it on John's challenge of money. You know, I'm trying to save costs during this litigation, but they're you know, being bled. Right. I'm being bled by this thing. So that's, that's kind of what goes well, on I, there. I, here's the interesting. I also had Karen Irvine. Not only did I have Janine Maceros, who just messed my kids over really bad, wouldn't let them go on a trip that they've yeah. gone on normally. Right. Uh, but it was, it'd be too traumatic for them to see their grandparents that they you know, right. go on these trips. But Karen Irvine was my uh, reunification therapist. Right. And... Uh, she got me to see my kids again, but I never saw them the day since. Right. She made the order that it was okay for me to see them yeah. unsupervised. Right. And since that day, I hadn't seen them for five years ah. until they got beyond 18. Um, and uh, so it was like, you know, you write the judge, you, you do what, you know, you tell the police, nothing. Yeah. You know, a violation of parental rights, criminal action, 609.26, deprivation of parental rights. And then you go to the police station in Maplewood, Ramsey County. Oh, it's uh, no, it's a custody issue. It's a civil issue. It says, no, it's not. Right. You know, well, we're not going to do any. Well, but you need to. Right. You know, well, then they get mad at you. Right. And you say, you get out of here or else. Right. You know, and then you right. play, I, wanna, I want a, uh, a court, a case number. Right. And then they get mad, right. you know. And then, but they think they have an out. And then you go, well, once you get the case number, it says, I'm going to file a report. Then they get mad again. Right. You know, now they got to file a report. Right. It's just a big game going on. But no, it really anyway, is. Uh, so, you know, let's go to number nine, because yeah. we'll show uh, uh, number nine. Uh, this shows where, so, you know, this will show that I paid the Green Law Office Trust $6,300 on May 23rd. Um, it's a, uh, you know, copy of the check. If they scroll down a little bit uh, on this thing, you can see that it's actually the yellow on the side. This endorsed. is the back, the endorsed part of the check going into uh, Green's, uh, you know, Trust IOLTA account. So now they've got the funds there. So money laundering means taking the money in, hiding it, and now they're kind of paying out, you know, these quasi-neutrals. But now here's where the part where it really comes in, where now we shift over to perpetrating a fraud upon the mm -hmm. court. So we've got this allegation of money laundering scheme. Right. Now we've got perpetrating a fraud upon the court, and let's go to the next uh, graphic over here. Okay, and on this graphic here, this is number 10. Now this would be a motion from Attorney Green, and this is her emotion. So the first thing is, we scroll down to the arrow there on number one, and it says, reducing petitioner's unpaid child support arrearages from September to July to a judgment against petitioner in the amount of 11000 Three hundred and eight dollars. So remember that number eleven thousand three hundred, you know, three hundred and eight dollars. And just scroll down a little more to the bottom. And this is where an attorney, it's called Rule Eleven, basically signs a thing that says, "Hey, we promise we're acting in good faith, and if we're not, you can bring a motion against us, and, and we'll pay for the cost." So this is sort of the this is called the Rule Eleven. So mm -hmm. I want to show you where this gets violated. If we can go to the next graphic. 
Okay, here it is. Now this, in support of that motion, uh, they had my estranged wife file a, an affidavit. And sure. if you scroll down to the bottom, you can see where she did this calculated, a total arrearage balances from September 1st, 2012 to July, $1,028 times 11 months equals $11,308. But wait a minute, didn't I pay $6,300? Didn't you just see that check? Shouldn't that amount be $5,008? But yet we have two documents filled out by the attorney and affidavit uh, by Camille Miser that are in a sense perpetrating a fraud upon the court. Mm -hmm. So now, how does this perpetrating of a fraud work? Well, let's go to number 12. <clears throat> number 12 is they filed documents, again, attesting to be true, with the Department of Health and Human Services saying John hasn't paid $11,308. So now I've got the uh, state of Minnesota coming after me, and they're going attempting to revoke driver's licenses, reporting to the credit bureaus, it, um, doing a bunch of different sanctions that are going along the way that are, you know, in the sense. Now, I've reported this to the police department or sheriff's department here just this past mm -hmm. week, and they brought these documents up to uh, uh, Patrick Siliberto and uh, Ron Hosevar down there in Scott County, prosecutors, and they just said, no, nah, this doesn't matter. Uh, you know, go deal with that with Judge Lennon. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, go deal with that with Judge Lennon. And if you go away, right, they don't right. have to deal with it. Uh, well, what's interesting here in that motion that was filed, um, the affidavit, that there was no breakdown of what was paid in, what was paid out, you know, what, it's supposed to be month by month, you know, right. and they didn't do that in, well, in that motion at all. It, it, the whole thing is, I mean, when we try and get down to it, like you were talking at the top of your segment, is, you know, is it rule of law? Okay. Or is it, is it a whim of a man or a woman in a black robe? Right. Well, one thing that's interesting here is that people may, get the, may think, well, were these two separate orders? Because you got the 6300 for the trust and then 6300 for child support. But your point is, no, it, it isn't two separate orders. They're the same, right? Right, right. right. We have that judge, the, the, the second order that came out, the judge, uh, Carolyn Lenning, you know, changed it. And so this order came out second and said, no, 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 this, this is child support arrearages. So uh -huh. it doesn't create an additional obligation. So not right. another $6,300, right. but just one $6,300, and I'm going to call that child support arrearages. So she's hiding that number from Department of Health and Human Services, in a way, putting it into a trust account, and now, now she's able to issue orders to bring out you know, these neutrals, Karen Irvine and Jean Maceros. Well, what kind of reports do you think they've said about me? Yeah. <laughs> if you said Genghis Khan, Stalin, Pol Pot, you might be kind of close. That's what kind of guy you I am, are. According, okay. according to uh, to these neutrals. Well, and did they ever back it up with evidence? No, no. And you haven't been able to go into court? No, nope, right no. now everything stayed, and everything has stayed right now. And the uh, are you PTE... Get, are you getting to see your son at all? No. No, the PTE, Maceros, has denied access to my son, and uh, my you know, estranged wife is denying access. No criminal charges? No criminal charges, Just and, and not contacting me to resolve a dispute. She's supposed to stop, because there's a stay, but the PTE and, and Attorney Green said, yeah. no, the PTE can continue. Well, what's really interesting, yeah. this week I got help from the Department of Health and Services state because I said, you know, the, the, the Scott County wasn't responding to me. I wrote them like 11 letters or a bunch of letters, and uh -huh. they wouldn't respond. And so finally the state got involved, and they stayed those actions that they're coming against me, by saying, we got to wait to see what the state does, if the judge is good to go or not. Mm -hmm. So we're going to stop all these actions. But Maceros is continuing to run wild, issuing orders to my son's school, saying the dad's a bad guy, he can't go there, don't let him volunteer. My son goes to a Christian school, I go there and I volunteer time, I take him to recess, I work with all the students with reading and math, I mm -hmm. volunteer, and they're saying I'm not allowed to volunteer. Okay. Based on her orders that the judge gave her... Power to yeah. do stuff. And, and right now you're stuck with that until... With no remedy. With no remedy. Now, my, my experience with Gene Maceros also was there's no discussion. No. It's just, I'm going to do this, and that's the way it's going to be. All right. It's yeah. just really frustrating. You know, I'm trying to get remedies. I've, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunity to come out here and talk with you and your audience to get this out there. Because yeah. if you're not being... If you're, if you're not upset or worried, you're, you're not yeah. paying attention. Yeah. And people just haven't got into this steamrolling maw. Right. 
Well, this is uh, another atrocity going on in our family law courts, and this is a, a, a lot of mistakes, and I can't call them mistakes. This is intentional. So, well, folks, thanks for watching. We appreciate it. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, uh, who's going to stand up for yours? Again, good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week.